Good morning, class. My name is Michael Geraldo Santana. A little bit about me. Well, my name is uh, <laughs> Michael Geraldo Santana. I'm a senior this year. I'm in DECA, BPA, Studco, and React. It's very fun being able to do community service this year. I've been able to reach the 100 hour mark and it's been a lot of fun. So my interviews to uh, this year, the first one I did, his name was Keith Ferguson. The funny thing about this one is that I actually had four people to interview. It was at Chief Oil and Gas and it was a very interesting interview. I was able to hear perspectives from each side. I was able to hear from the management side to the financial side, to the actual person that's been drilling in the field. It's really interesting to be able to hear all those sides, especially for my first interview. The next interview I went on was with Jenna Anaya, and she's actually self-employed. She goes around looking at other rigs and makes sure everything is at the quality standard they want to be at. It's, it was really fun being able to talk to her. We met at a Starbucks and it was really easy flow of conversation. It was a lot of fun to see someone that was actually self-employed and to see that a petroleum engineer can actually do that. And with the next interview I went on, his name was Larry Chaplin. He's the v vice president of DeGloria Macintosh. With this, he actually, I got more of the management side feel because I was able to meet a person that started off at school here in Texas A&M and he was able to move himself up from vice president at such a quick pace. It was because of he taught me about time management as well as the work ethic. Even though you might not meet every single deadline, you want to make sure that you hit the best you can within the time limit you have. And if you need more time, you let them know slowly and softly that if they give you more time, the result will be a lot better. Miguel Coquise was the next interview I went on, and he's actually a reservoir engineer, which is more the financial side of all the petroleum engineering. And the funny thing about him is that he had an uh, intern Tyler with him Wright, as well. He had um, uh, <laughs> an interviewee with him as well, internship, and I was able to interview both of them, and he actually went to Texas UT Austin, I was able to learn more about their program as well. And my last one was Pat Handran, which is, is my uh, mentor this year, and he is the West Region Well Integrity Manager at Deadberry Resources. The thing with Pat is that really excited me is that he's a person that just doesn't look at something and then go along. He looks at it and he analyzes it. Such as an example is that we're on a newspaper that was talking about all the earthquakes going around in Arlington and they had a picture of like damage from an earthquake but the when they're looking at the picture the picture was in Oklahoma it had nothing to do with Arlington at all it's just a picture of destruction but when people see that they're like wow it's all this fracking and stuff doing with petroleum engineering is hurting Arlington but in reality it's just an earthquake that happened in Oklahoma so it's really cool to be able to see all those different sides all right, petroleum engineering. The fastest growing career seen to date. It is said that petroleum engineer will, will go 26% from 2012 to 2022. This is much faster than all the other occupations. You may ask how a career not mentioned seven years ago could have this kind of boom. Well, it's because the demand for oil is never ending. We, have, we use petroleum on our cars, planes, and other motor devices. We use petroleum to power heating and electricity generation. And that's not all. We use petroleum engineering to make, oh, petroleum, we use it to make clothes, refrigerators, toothpaste, tires, CDs, cell phones, and much, much more. This is where petroleum engineers come in. Petroleum engineers design and develop methods for extracting oil and gas from deposits below the Earth's surface. Petroleum engineers also find new ways to extract oil from older wells. This is easier said than done. It could take decades to get all the petroleum out of the well. It all depends on how much petroleum the well has, and the more petroleum, the longer it takes. But it's better for the petroleum engineers to get to stay in one location rather than traveling all around the world. Because there's so many things petroleum engineers have to do, 
they are separated in different sections. The first one is drilling engineers. Drilling engineers are involved in estimating the value of reserves, estimating the costs to access them, acquiring necessar necessary property by lease, conducting a geological survey, designing a well bore, and acquiring necessary layout and type of equipment to reach the depth. These are engineers that are always traveling around the world. Mainly it can be, well, at this point in time, make the Middle East, Canada, Mexico, all around the spots where we get most of our oil. And they could spend months, if not years, in just one location. So if raising a family would be difficult in this type of occupation, but it's really cool to be able to travel the world while you're working. Uh, I have a short video here that shows what drilling is all about. Huh. Yeah, it looks like the sound's not working, but I can. I mean, like the sound's working, but. Oh. Okay. Like the voice that goes along with the cartoon, it wasn't working. I guess now it is. But this is just them being able to drill. You can see what the drilling well actually looks like. It's not as big as some people imagine it, like a huge hole just drilling it. It's just a small, tiny hole, but it gets so much oil out of that small hole. Yeah, the cartoon voice is not working. Well, okay. You must be extremely careful when handling this type of powerful machinery one mishap in the entire oil rig could explode. Several oil rigs have actually burned down due to the lack of observation. Like the one in the Gulf that was engulfed in flames not too long ago. Here's a little example of what happens when you're not looking carefully and just going on doing your normal day at work. He closed it without actually sealing it correctly. Let's just do that one more time, see what he actually does in this area. No one actually died in that, but there was a little bit of injuries from falling back, but you have to be extremely careful when handling this type of machinery. Another type of petroleum engineer is the reservoir engineer. Reservoir engineers estimate the size of the oil and gas deposit and find most of the effective way to do it. They're the engineers that do all the financial procedures. They tend to stay close at home and work in office settings. They do not start out with the same salary as a drilling engineer but they have more room to go, grow. They don't have that glass ceiling on top of them as drilling engineers do. They could become owners of companies while drilling engineers have a roof over them. Last but not least, we have production engineers. They design and select equipment to get the well to the produce the oil and gas after it's drilled. Once the drilling engineers are done, the production engineers come in and try to find like, how to get the oil and gas out of there. Uh, they use several different methods depending on how, where the location is and how much is in there. Even though this sounds like a prosperous career, you don't know how the economy is going to change. When the economy goes bad, usually <clears throat> the gas goes down, uh, actually gas goes up, so we usually don't, it's better for the petroleum engineering company, but it's not better for the economics. But whenever 
the economy was really high, such as a little bit ago, the oil prices dropped really low. And that was also because of OPEC and other situations that went along with it, but it dropped really low, which people might think, oh, wow, look, I can spend more money on other stuff. But a lot of the engineers are people that get paid in six figures or higher. So dropping those people out of pay, the money's not going back into the economy. So in return, that's actually hurting the economy more than it's helping. Once they lose their job, the, it's really hard to find another one, especially because once you lose it, you have to go to mainly a lower size company and you aren't going to gain that much money from it because they usually go on freeze once something like that happens and they don't want any more jobs coming in. There was over 400,000 jobs that dropped this, this coming lower boom, or we call it a bust. But uh, Americans are actually being able to cope with this right now because of how much we're drilling in, and I'll explain that more later. Now that we've talked about uh, the team that takes the petroleum out, let's talk about the advancements we've made throughout the years. You've probably seen a movie or some type of clip where oil is just spurting out of a spindle top. Thousands if not millions of gallons of oil has been lost this way. Now everything is conserved and planned well. We always have, or if we believe we'll hit a jackpot, they'll put more storage units in place and they'll send it off to a plant where the chemical engineers actually process it. And this is a way more efficient way to get the oil out and put it into different deposits. So for this year, my original work, what I wanted to do is I wanted to answer several questions. What type of rocks make the best storage rocks? Which one like, can hold the most amount of oil? I also wanted to know which one of these rocks are most permeable, like just water can just pass through it. Which one of these rocks are good cap rocks that can hold the storage rocks so it doesn't just like flow all around? And to answer these questions, I just need to look at the three different types of rocks. We have metamorphic, igneous, and sedimentary. What I did is that each rock should be numbered depending on how it was made. I had five sedimentary rocks, five igneous rocks, and five metamorphic. And I poured one cup of mineral oil because it's at the same density as what oil is right now. So I used that and I placed each rock in there for an hour. I recorded the amount of mineral oil that was left and then I just refill it and record each one as it goes along. For igneous rocks, the rocks I have used, um, these igneous rocks are rocks that have been solidified by lava or magma. And the rocks I have used, number one is obsidian, number two is granite, number three is basalt, number four is pumice, and number five is raw light. And with these, I, I took a look at them and none of them were able to give me a result. Therefore, none of them were actually permeable because the lava, once it solidifies, there's no permeability. Uh, for metamorphic rocks, these rocks have undergone transformation by heat, pressure, or other natural agencies. And the different ones I use, number one is salt, number two is marble, number three is quartites, number four is genus, and number five, it's snitch, I believe it's what's pronounced. And placing each one of these in the mineral oil, only number three was able to draw anything from it, but it was not that significant. It was about less than a fourth from it. So we moved on to sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are rocks that are formed from the sediment deposit by where, uh, water and air that just compress each other, but because of the minerals, they're gonna have holes in them. And the different ones I used, number one is shale, number two is collarcus tufa, number three is sandstone, number four is conglomerate, and number five is limestone. And as I placed each one inside the mineral oil, I was able to, once I took it out, there's, for shale, it was seventh eighth of a cup still left. For collarcus tufa, there was three fourths of the th mineral oil still left. Sandstone was seven eighths. Uh, conglomerate was also seven eighths. And limestone was three fourths. So, based on my experiment, 
uh, this is the measurements pulling them out. But based on my experiments, sedimentary rocks are the rocks that are the most permeable. Limestone is the most permeable and the best cap rock to keep all of it in is shale. All igneous rocks are impermeable because in, uh, the igneous rocks are too compact for oil to go through. This means they're bad uh, rocks for drills to go through as well as metamorphic rocks. Petroleum engineers look for sedimentary rocks when drilling. They also look for the cap rock to be on top of it so there's nothing coming out but on the bottom it moves really swiftly so you can have a rock that actually can trap the oil and actually let it in as well. So it works both ways and it's really easy to get out but you don't always have that type of situation but it's the best situation to be in. Then we're going to talk about a little bit about how much the U.S. consumes in engineering. This is more of my final product. What I did is that I classified each one into a subsection. I'm going to go through the cons and pros of each one and give a realistic look at what real clean energy is, as well as an American timeline for energy independence. So energy consumption. We consume 95 quadrillion British thermal units a year. Well, this was the year 2012. A total of 83% is fossil fuels and 17% is clean energy. Now, this might be uh, too old for you guys to remember, but here's the, the good, the, oh, is, there we go. We're going to talk a little bit about the good. Oh, yeah, it's all good. It's about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly over fossil fuels. So coal is the worst of them all. They get about one, uh, $135 billion from government subsidies. The, pro, the pros of it is coal is inexpensive. There's a large deposits of coal available. There are plenty of coal supplies in the Western countries. We've had them for decades. Uh, easily converted to energy and coal does not require extensive like secondary technologies to do. It's just easy, quick and go. The cons are pretty strong as well. We have polluting chemicals that are dangerous for health, other toxins that are released from coal from uh, dangerous to natural habitats as well. This is a non-renewable source. And while coal reserves have existed for decades, eventually throughout time it's going to decrease and no longer there. And a little bit thing I wanted to go through is that they actually came up with something called clean coal right now. And what they're doing is that it's a concept where you migrate emissions from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So basically what they do is that they take the coal and they put it, they heat it up real quickly, but they only take the gas emissions from it and not releasing so much CO2 and other polluting things into the air. So it's a lot cleaner, but and it's a lot more efficient, but it's just a little bit more work to do it, but it's a lot better than releasing everything into the natural habitat. Next we have is crude oil. Crude oil only gets 0.5 billion dollars from the government. It's more it's because they they receive so much money that they don't really need that much government subsidies and this is the ugly. The pros is that it's considerably easy to handle, to store and to transport. It's easier to extract from the ground than coal and more cost effective to transport. The cons of it is that burning oil for energy purposes like coal results in emissions of carbon gases, which in return hurts the atmosphere. In addition, there are numerous safety hazards involved in the exploration of oil onshore and inshore. And drilling may affect the ocean and terrestrial habitats. And what we have now is the good. The good is natural gas. Natural gas actually gets $89 billion in government subsidies. There, it's the cleanest of all the fossil fuels. It uh, emits 45% less CO2 than coal and 30% less than oil. Um, it can be used at, uh, as automated fuel, which I'll go into more. It's really cool. I was able to look more into this. It burns cleaner than gasoline and diesel. 
and it has no water or residue to deal with. And the cons that it contains, it contains like 80 to 95 percent methane. So the problem with that is going to be really flammable. It's what we use to start up our uh, stoves, but some use the electricity, but some use the gas as well. And now here's what we consider clean energy. Uh, some things that are not really reliable, but also have the most efficiency, which nuclear energy we consider clean. Which nuclear energy, out of all the clean energy, is going to have the most efficient, it's going to power the most, but it's also the scariest in my point of view. Um, there are over 104 commercial nuclear power plants in the USA. Illinois itself has six nuclear power plants, which is kind of scary, but it powers a lot. And it gets about $73 billion in government subsidies. Um, it has a large power generating capacity. Uh, it's also able to meet most of the industrial and cities' needs. It emits far fewer greenhouse gases during electricity generation than coal. Uh, it causes more beneficial in terms of climate crisis to replace other har harnessing methods we use today with nuclear energy. The environment effects of nuclear power are relatively light compared to the other ones such as coal. And it also has a high energy density. The cons is definitely the high construction cost to the complex way it's made because you don't want it to go off and hurt a lot of the economy and people as well. And the waste can last about 200 to 500,000 years. So what we do with the waste, we actually ship it off to different countries because we don't want to deal with it. We don't have an actual storage to keep all the waste from there, but China does. But what China does is just put it in a relatively, like, kind of a secure location, so a lot of people get affected from that in China. But again, it's really beneficial for them for the money-wise. Uh, another con is the accidents that have happened. We've seen throughout the years of several nuclear power plants that have actually broken off and gone off, and the causes of that and all the different cities that have been evacuated because of it. Even though it's really efficient for its size and really clean, it has the dangerous risk to go along with it. Next is hydroelectric energy. It gets about $90 billion from the government subsidies. The good thing about this is that it's renewable. Uh, this means we cannot ever use it up for as long as we live. This is going to be there. It's safe compared to all the other ones. There's not a huge risk factor to go along with it as well. It's a clean energy source, as you may expect. Uh, it's one of the cleanest of them all. The cons that go along with it is droughts. Right now, California is actually experiencing that, and they're having to go to a lot more crude oil to power everything. So they've actually gone to Canada and started importing a lot of their oil instead of going to hydroelectric because they're in a huge drought right now. It's really expensive to also build these type of plants and to keep all the hydroelectric power to go through. And sometimes it's actually environmentally damaging because it requires different animals and species to move out of their habitats and to fit our own needs other than theirs. And now we're going to more of like the really strong renewable energies, which would be wind and solar. Going into wind, it gets about $13 billion in government subsidies. It's really space efficient because the largest wind turbine can actually generate about 600 homes, which um, they can't be placed too close to each other, but the land in between them can be used for other things, such as planting, because even though there's a lot of space between them, they can do other things in this space. It's not only restricted for wind energy. It's also completely renewable because wind is able to, we don't have to do anything for that to come, but just wind just comes at different times. But the con to come with that is that it's really unpredictable. You don't know when the strongest wind is going to be there. What if it stops for a long time and then you're out of that energy? So it's not really dependable on that side of the farm. It's also a threat to wildlife. Birds, bats, and other flying 
creatures, <laughs> thousands have actually been killed because they go through this thing and just chops them up. Or just they just hit that and it just kills them. Um, and also the noise. The noise, even though when you see in movies, you just see like it's completely silent, it's just going through. In reality, it's a huge noise that comes along with it. It's, it in that type of area, it's going to sound for about 50 miles away. It's really, really loud. And also, I wanted to talk about a little bit of the magnets, like how we actually make this clean energy source. What we actually do is we get the, it's a rare earth mineral that we use in this for the magnets to power this wind. And what we get, we get this from China. China is the biggest rare earth minerals. But what China does is that in order to extract this type of mineral, you have to release this poisonous liquid that comes out. And what they actually did is that for profit wise, because we're demanding so much of the magnet, they let the oil, I mean the, the poisonous liquid get into some of the water system that goes throughout China. And there's been reported about 5,000 to date that have been, have died because of it. There's a lot more that has been sick because of it. They just, and to be honest, they don't really do anything about it. They just care more about the profit more than anything else. And it's kind of scary to see because we also have a factor in that in order to have clean energy. The next one we have is also solar, which our pros are going to be, it's, um, Pros are going to be we get actually thirty-five dollars, uh, thirty-five billion dollars from government subsidies. It's harnessing solar energy, so as long as we are going to be here, the sun is going to be here. So it's really dependent on that, um, and it's low maintenance. You just you power it up from there, and then you just leave it. But the con with it is that it takes a lot of space. It's not as efficient as wind. So it's going to take up a lot of land, and that land can only be used for that solar technology, at least such as a large footprint right there. There we go. And now we're going to talk about the road to energy independence. Oh man, this sounds not working. There we go. Declaration to energy independence. All right. So. Going into this, this is a really hard task for America to actually be completely energy independent because we've actually been reducing our energy imports by a ton. We, the quadrillion BTU we had in 2006, it was at 30. Already in, this is 2012 and we're already about 12. We've uh, lowered more than half of our imports and that and then going into more of the petroleum side we actually were able to, what were we at? We're at 2006, about 3,750, and we dropped all the way to about 1,200. So, and this is 2015, a little bit adding on to that. But with that, we actually use in a day 16.5 million barrels of petroleum. So, and we are able to produce right now about 9.5 billion a day. But with that, the thing we can't presume in the future is that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. If we're going to want more energy consumption, if we're going to go more to renewable energy so we can lower the amount. So what I did is that I focused more on what the trend looks like right now, where it's heading and what it's looking like. And right now, um, some of the proponents of U.S. energy independence such as ethanol, fuel, methane, biodiesel, and plug-in hybrid would help, like just with the reduction of oil, because the thing is that we can't completely rely on oil if we want to be independent. It's not going to work because we are, we're halfway there. We're at 70% right now on only American oil, but we have other nations actually in America. So there's no way that they would give up that type of plant because the plants they have are crucial because they process like a particular oil that we can't actually do and they have the plants to do it. So we need to get it from them in order to do that. So to be completely self-efficient, we're actually going to have to go to a new renewable source. And to that, I say we should move on to natural gas because they're already, I don't know if you guys know, but they're already trucks 
that are running on natural gas. There's specific gas stations that actually have the natural gas pump. Even though it's highly flammable, it's actually way cheaper, way more efficient than gas itself. So you're going to go farther.